I want to thank Greg and uh, introduce myself. I'm Danilo Bracaraziosi. I'm the video compression engineer for Ostendo Technology. We are a company in Southern California in Carlsbad. And I'm going to talk about compression for full parallax light field display. Stefan, I don't know, well, okay. Uh, for full parallax light field displays, for the deployment of full parallax light field displays, we have two challenges that we're faced with. The first one is actually the generation of content. So because full parallax light field displays uh, utilize several more views than common stereoscopic displays, we actually have to spend a lot of time, power, and memory to generate that content. And then the second challenge that we have here is the extremely high bandwidth requirements that we have to send this huge amount of data to the display. At Ostendo, we have developed a compression framework that we called compressed rendering. This compression framework is able to tackle the, uh, both challenges uh, with one unique step. And that step that is called compressed rendering, it's able to reduce the rendering time, power consumption, and memory usage. I guess it's not on, maybe. Okay. Sorry. No, that And in typical uh, compression, uh, in typical light field displays, full parallax light field displays, the, um, both rendering and compression are steps that are made separate, are made one, a, uh, one after the other. So for rendering, usually the entire light field is generated. But as you can see, there is a lot of redundant information in this light field. And then compression is the next step that it's used to remove this redundancy and then uh, get to a size that is feasible to send to the decoder, and then the decoder will reconstruct, will just decompress the data and reconstruct the light field. So this all requires time and memory and possibly increased computational power to render and then compress the light field. At Ostendo, we have developed the compressed rendering, which is based on a new paradigm of render and compress in one step. And the compressed rendering minimizes redundant data by rendering only a subset of elemental images. So this enables savings on memory requirements at the encoder side and possibly reduces power and time consumption. So here's a flowchart of our compressed rendering scheme. And then at the decoder side, we perform what we call the visibility test. We will analyze shape, position, and texture of the elements of the light field data and only select a couple of elemental images to render. So not all elemental images are actually generated. And then those elemental images selected to render, we, have, we obtain the texture and the depth, the per pixel depth of each of those elemental images. Per pixel depth is converted into disparity. Everything is packetized together and sent to the decoder. And then at the decoder side, what we have is a multiple reference depth image based rendering algorithm that will reconstruct the entire light field. Let's see some details of the process. So for example, for the visibility test, that's a new algorithm that was developed to select a subset of elemental images to be rendered, eliminating redundant information at the generation stage. So we take the field of view and the distance of the object to the screen and determine the distance between the reference elemental images. All the elemental images in between those reference images are redundant and can be reconstructed by using the references. The reconstruction is made at the decoder side. And here is uh, a block diagram of the, of the multiple reference DIBR. What is unique about uh, our approach here is that we don't use what is normally used in deaf image based rendering algorithm, which is at most two views, the left and right view. We actually use multiple views. Uh, and the use of multiple views uh, is uh, uh, it's actually beneficial for us because we avoid 
the whole feeling process. And then one of the first things that we do is actually with the multiple disparities and multiple textures of the reference image, we first perform forward warping, which is a projection from the reference to the target elemental image. And as you can see, there are some problems with this forward warping, which are caused by round off and quantization errors uh, of the disparity map. And then in, in order to mitigate those artifacts, we apply a crack filter. A crack filter is a smoothing filter customized for disparity maps that eliminates all those uh, black lines, so all those problems with the warped uh, disparity. The next step is to merge those, for example, four uh, disparities together. And as you can see here, we will obtain the disparity map of our target holder. And then in possession of this disparity map and the references texture, we perform backward warping, which is kind of like the inverse operation of forward warping. While forward warping, we are projecting from the reference to the target elemental image, backward warping will do uh, the inverse and will fetch the texture from the reference images. And then in order to analyze, to assess uh, our compression performance, we did some simulations using a hypothetical light field display. So in our simulations, we, the, we uh, decided on a couple of parameters for our hypothetical light field display. One of them is the screen resolution. We are just using 280 by 720 pixels. The field of view of the lenses is 20 degrees. And the lens size and the pixel size is 800 microns and 80 microns, respectively. For the input of the light field, uh, we, are, we use the Stanford Dragon. And we position the Stanford gra uh, Dragon at 90 millimeters in front of the display. And we also needed to redimension the Stanford Dragon to fit into the viewing zone of the display. So one of the things that uh, we we analyzed was the effect of the lens size and the pixel size on the compression performance. So our first uh, simulation was to actually analyze the different lens pitch. So the dimension of the display is fixed, and the number of lenses is determined by the optics that will cover the display. So in this case, we can just modify the optics of the display. We have different uh, sizes of elemental lens. And we also uh, uh, maintain the FOV, the field of view of the lenses. So as you can see here, smaller lenses uh, and bigger lenses, they have a different uh, focal distance. And also bigger lenses will have more angular information or more pixels on the image. And how does that translate to the compression performance? So here you can see three measurements that we did. One is the rate compression. That is, the total bits that we spent by sending the reference texture and disparate information divided by the total, um, uh, the total bits that uh, are necessary to represent the texture only. So since we have with small uh, lenses, and we also select just a couple of lenses in the visibility test, we have a very high compression. We have a 1,000 to 1 compression. And as the size of the lens gets bigger, the number of lenses on the total, the total number of lenses also reduces. And with that, also the compression uh, is reduced. But we also need to analyze the quality of the reconstructed light field. And the quality first we present here is the PSNR, the peak signal to noise ratio. And as you can see, the opposite uh, happens. With smaller lenses, you have a, a really bad quality, while with larger lenses, you have a higher quality. Another measurement that I want to present that it's an interesting one to talk about is the SSIM, the Structure Similarity Index. The Structure Similarity Index is an index that goes from 0 to 1, where 1 represents the best index, and it tells you the preservation of the structure of the image. But I, di I didn't just apply the SSIM to the reconstructed light field. I actually transformed the light field from elemental images into sub-images. Sub-images are, uh, you, you form sub-images by gathering pixels with the same angular information. 
which is equivalent to an orthogonal projection, and it's very similar to what the user would see when it looked at the display at a certain uh, angle. And uh, with that, you have uh, uh, the SSIM. It's correlated to what the viewer would see from the light field. And here, as you can see, with 0.8 millimeters, the compression affects the structure of the light field, while with 6.4, the structure is very well preserved. And that is all because the, we heavily uh, rely on a DIBR, and the DIBR benefits from the high resolution reference. That is, the artifacts are mainly caused by low resolution reference using the DIBR. So the second uh, simulation was using varying the pixel pitch. So now the lenses are exactly the same, but the pixel pitch just uh, gets more dense. So we have the, our initial pixel pitch, which is 80 microns, and we go to 40 microns, 20 microns, 10 microns. And then here, is, here are the results. For the rate, the rate is actually maintained because the rate is uh, basically the ratio between the selected lenses and the number of lenses in the display, and that doesn't change with the pixel pitch. However, with 10 microns, we have a lot more data to deal here. So we have a lot more uh, time and power to process the entire light field. And we also have to have a lot more memory at the decoder side to hold the entire light field. And on the, as for the PSNR and the SSIM, we can see that the smaller the pixel, the higher the resolution, the higher the resolution of the reference image, the best the quality that we have. So we can see here from those two uh, results that it's good to use a higher quality, uh, a higher resolution. But not necessarily we can have this high resolution at the display. We may be constrained by, by memory. We may be constrained by other aspects. So what can we do to improve the quality and uh, without modifying the, the pixel pitch or the lenses? So one of the things that we did was we came up with this high resolution scheme which is a multi-resolution framework to the DIBR uh, algorithm. And in that, we added this down sample uh, block here, right after the multi-resolution. And for the multi-resolution step, we use high resolution references instead of the low resolution. So only the references are high resolution. And then after that, we need to down sample, and then we store the low resolution, because that's what we're going to use at the display anyway. And then what is the effect of using the high resolution on our compression framework. As you can see, of course, there is a decrease in compression performance because we, are, we need to send more data, we need to send uh, more information, but there is an increase in quality and that's the key issue here. There is also an increase in the structure of the light field. And I'm gonna show you uh, next how that really appears. So we can see that the high resolution uh, reference uh, improves the synthesized light field quality and also in this scheme we save memory at the decoder side so we don't need to store the high resolution uh, light field we can just store the lower resolution that is used at the display anyway. So another way to try to send more information and improve the reconstruction quality is to maybe send more references. That's also another way to send more information. But how, how does that affect our reconstruction. So in our case, we did some simulations where we divided the distance, we reduced the distance between the references, just sending more uh, reference images. And with that, we can see here a comparison that's a rate distortion graphic. And here, it's a comparison between the high resolution, using high resolution images, and just using more references. And in the case of, uh, of low bit rates, you can see that the high resolution is actually capable of improving the quality while the low resolution is always affected by the low quality, the inaccurate inaccuracies in the disparity map. So it's actually better to just send more information contained in one in the references that I'm using than just to send more information. And then here is a sub image that is that collection of pixels with the same angular information. So this is similar to what the user would actually see. It's not exactly the same, but it's somewhat very highly correlated to it. So that's for a 0.8 millimeters uh, lens size. So we have 
a, a somewhat good uh, spatial resolution for the display. This is the original image, so without any compression. This is the, recom the reconstructed image using high resolution references. And this is the reconstructed image just using more references. And here you can see the structure, how the structure of the perceived light field was affected by compression and how with high resolution images we were able to reconstruct, we were able to um, improve the perceived quality. So to conclude this presentation, uh, I wanna just go over some, uh, again, the concepts. Our Ostendo's compressed rendering technique has introduced the following novel concepts. We have a visibility test followed by a multiple reference DIBR and also a high resolution multiple reference DIBR. That generates the entire light field directly at the display just using a subset of images. It avoids the rendering of redundant data, alleviates the complexity of the rendering stage and reduces display interface bandwidth, memory requirements and throughput, and processing requirements and power consumption, which is key especially to when we talk about displays with uh, full parallax light field displays and the amount of data is huge, so that's exactly what we want to avoid also and in the entire process. So here we saw that we analyzed the effects of pixel and elemental lens sizes in the compression performance and concluded that the resolution of elemental images affect the multi-reference DIBR algorithm. We then used the high resolution reference images. We showed that with high resolutions, we were able to synthesize light fields with higher quality. Here I presented results without any compression of the high resolution images. So our next step in future work is uh, the compression of these high resolution references using well-known image and video compression techniques. And also uh, we presented here the SSIM, which was uh, a somewhat good uh, parameter of evaluation of light fields, but it's always recommended to have a subjective evaluation of the light field, or a subjective evaluation of your compression artifacts. And that's also our plan. We want to do subjective evaluation, but this time using a prototype full parallax light field that's being developed by this uh, Ostendo right now. So I want to thank you all for attending this talk. Uh, I think we have maybe a minute for a couple of questions. If I'm not able to answer all your questions, here's my email, and you're always welcome to contact me at any time.